receive from the Lord today? Russ, come here real quick. Listen, uh, I'm, I'm so excited about what God's doing in this place. But how many of you realize the Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice and sorrow with those who sorrow? Amen? And we need to carry one another's burdens, right? Um, listen, I, I just wanted to kind of just interject something that's very important right now. And um, we, have, we have a very urgent prayer request that I want to, I believe that 4,000 teenagers can move the hand of God. I believe 4,000 teenagers can believe God for a miracle. Amen? I said, how many of you believe God can do a miracle? Listen, I have, I have a very urgent need that's just really just hit me in the stomach while ago when Russ shared it, and I just want us to pray about it. Russ, share with us real quick the situation. Uh, one of my leaders that's here, she, her name's Jane, and we just got a report this morning. Her dad has cancer, but it's to the point now where his stomach is filling with fluid. There's nothing they can do to stop it. Today, her parents are actually going to make funeral arrangements for her dad. And you know, there's a possibility she don't even get home to see her dad before he passes away. So, where, where's Jane at? Where y'all at? Y'all over here again? Everybody extend just this way, okay? I want everybody to just extend this way right now. How many of you believe God can do a miracle right now? Wouldn't it be incredible? Right now, I want you to lift your voices. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we haven't come here for fun and games. We come here to do business. We believe, Lord, that you're Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, our healer, and we speak the healing word of God right now to Jane's father. Yes. Lord, we ask that at this very moment, at, at 949, Lord, a miracle will take place in Montana. Lord, the glory of God would fall in that hospital room, Lord, and that you would clear up the fluid. Lord, that you would bring a healing to his body in the name of Jesus. Lord, we cry out to you for a miracle right now in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, come and strengthen Jane, her family, Lord. Father, let your glory be seen and we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Lord, in the name of Jesus, show yourself strong today in Jesus' name. Everybody give Jesus a clap of praise this morning. I'm trading my sorrows. Hallelujah. Let's praise him this morning. Jesus.
Hallelujah, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, that you have already won our battles for us, Lord God. That we don't have to fight in our flesh, Lord God, but that we can just rely on you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for freedom, God. Thank you that we can come into this place, Lord Jesus, and worship you however we please, Lord God. Thank you for taking the chains off of, of my life, Lord God. Thank you for taking the religion off, God. You know, I grew up in church since I was born. My dad was a, a pastor, so I'm a, I'm a PK. And I've seen a lot of stuff in church. And when you see a lot of stuff, sometimes it makes you grow cold to just church in general. You know, you think if, if that's the way serving God is, then I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. And um, I never really had that type of experience where I was turned off, but you just get used to doing the church thing. It just, it's so easy because um, we are all creatures of habit, as Brother Richard says all the time. We, everybody has a routine, a ritual of some sort, whether it be how you get up in the morning or how you t carry out a certain action. It's just, it's just natural. But um, we all, at some point, learn how to do the do the church thing. We learn this worship team can, you know, play all kinds of songs in our sleep. You know, it's not it's not like um, it's always fresh for us all the time. But when the spirit of God takes over, it is fresh. And even though you may be tired this morning, even though you may be weary. Um, we're not supposed to be controlled by our emotions or our, our physical body. That's not what we were made for. We are spiritual beings, and we're supposed to be controlled by our spirit. And sometimes that takes some, some discipline, you know? And it really is um, a mindset. It's, you either have an earthly mindset or a heavenly mindset. And if you get an earthly mindset, that means that everything is about you, Everything um, revolves around your life and what you like and what you want and the way you feel. And I'm sure there's some of you here that are making your youth group, you know, suffer for your own, you know, complaining and all that stuff because everything's just about you. And, um, you know, that's, that's an earthly mindset. And my prayer is that this week, that we would stop thinking with our earthly minds and our earthly hearts, but that we would start seeing things through God's eyes and seeing things through Jesus' eyes and feeling things with his heart. And something I, something I told our, our youth group last week, I said, you know, we, um, we get so used to living life on this earth. You know, we get so comfortable because we think, hey, we're here for about eh, 70 years or whatever, you know, some of us sooner than others, but I mean, um, the, the Bible says that our life is just a vapor, and what we have to do here, we have to do quickly, but we need to always keep our eyes on things above, and once you grasp that, once you got a hold of that, everything you do will be for eternity's sake. It won't be for you and now. It will be for Him forever. Amen. And I'm, I'm, my prayer all the time is, Lord, make me more and more homesick for home, for my heaven, heaven, and, um, and not longing for the things of this world. But I'm just praying that even now, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would just rush into this place, God, and hit our tired bodies right now. And that you would just give us a second wind, Lord God, that we would not stand here with our blank stares and our arms folded, Lord, but that we would say, I don't care how I feel right now. The Lord's still worthy of my praise. And um, I'm not going to be controlled by my flesh anymore because I don't want to have to wait till I get to the eighth song until you guys are finally with me. And um, I know that... Uh, you get excited about other things, because I've seen you all do it. You go to your football games and your basketball games, and you scream your head off, but you come to church, and you're, you're too tired. And um, that's, that's craziness. You, 
you guys are too, too young for that kind of stuff. So uh, I want you guys to kind of shake off whatever it is that's chaining you down today. And uh, let's get with the program. Let's get with the Lord's program today. And uh, let's ask God to make us a little more homesick, all right? Because he's coming back at any moment. You better be ready.
long to the day, God, when everything that I do and say is just Jesus. Lord, that every word that comes out of my mouth is, is Lord, words that are inspired by you, God. As the body of Christ, we say, God, we want to embrace whatever it is you're doing, Lord. Even though I don't understand it sometimes, I say, God, here I am, I'm yours. Because I know you're moving among the earth, Lord. I know you're sending revival, God. And I don't want to be left out. be left out, God. Behold, our God is gracious. He's moving among the nations, preparing a bride for Jesus. That's you. Improving, he reigns. His spirit is tearing down walls built on the pride of men. And to those who rejected him, he's reaching his hand out again. stands with oil and he is restoring his people by rains of sweet renewal in the music of heaven
swallow Just want to embrace your love We're not longing for anything else in this world Just want you, Lord Just want you, God You're
us this day our daily bread. Father, we thank you for what you have done thus far in the conference. But Lord, yesterday was yesterday. Today's a new day. Father, we ask that you would continue to equip us, continue, Lord, to challenge us, fill us, Lord, with vision and fire. Lord, I ask that you would give to us the word of God today and give us ears to hear what you want to say. Father, if I know my heart, if I know my heart, you're all that I want. You're all that I want, Jesus. You're all that I want. As the worship team continues to worship the Lord, you may begin to make your way back to your seat this morning. Just continue to worship with us as you make your way back. Let's sing that one more time. You're all that I want. Crucify the flesh. Pour vision inside. Raise up a generation. Oh, a generation that will seek your face. Generation who wants to know you. Know you with all the heart. standing just for a moment. I'm not real good with introductions, but let me just say this. Whenever we plan and we put together a conference, one of my greatest cries and one of my greatest desires is I don't want just talented people and gifted people and uh, people who know how to woo crowds and stir hearts and emotions. And I just, um, you know, emotionalism, I'm a very emotional person, but um, after the emotions are gone, that's when the real person comes out and that's what's important to me. And the speakers that we try to bring in for our conference, um, the person is much more important to me than the ministry because to me ministry is just an overflow of who you are and um, I know that you thoroughly enjoyed the ministry of Mike Rowan yesterday and um, go ahead you can do that but um my friend this morning who's going to come to the platform this morning is truly a friend. Um, 
I can honestly say that he's probably one of my best friends. He lives in Mobile, and uh, he's been in ministry for quite some time. And he's on the cutting edge of what God is doing in this day and, and hour. And um, I'm, I'm so excited to be able to have Johnny Jernigan be with us this morning. And I know many of you know who he is, others of you may not know, but what you see is what you get with Johnny. And I love that. And I know that the Lord is going to use him in a, in a mighty way to continue to speak into your heart and to birth some things in your spirit and vision within you. And so I want you to be open this morning as my good friend comes to share the word of the Lord this morning. Would you make Johnny Jernigan come? Hallelujah. Just remain standing. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout this morning. Can we do it? Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your name. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Everybody smile big. Let me see all your teeth. Make this faith declaration out loud. Say it loud. Say, I'm on my way to a better day. Smile and shout it. I'm on my way to a better day. Now, how many of you know if you tell a lie long enough, you'll believe it? How many know if you tell the truth long enough, you'll believe it? And the truth is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Come on, shout it. If God is for us, who can be against us? Come on, shout it. If God is for us, who can be against us? Shout it again. If God is for us, who can be against us? I hope you believe that today, and that's what we're going to minister on this morning. My name's Johnny, but I don't know all of you, so on the count of three, everybody tell me your name as loud as you can. Here we go. One, two, three. Good. Nice to meet you. I know everybody now. Everybody say this now. Everybody say, hey now. Hey now. We embrace your move. We embrace your now. Move. Hey now. Hey now. We embrace your love. Come on, shout it. Hey now. We embrace your move. Head now. now. We embrace your love. Embrace oh, you got it now. Head now. now. We embrace your move. Embrace Come on now. Head now. now. We embrace your love. Embrace your I have a very good friend who's a minister of a Bible college in Quebec, Canada. Leonard Ravenhill came, spoke to him, he prayed. He said, Brother Ravenhill, I want you to pray for me. He spoke this to him and he said, you know what? Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. And I want you to know it's very, very easy for us to make the declaration that we've just made out of our mouth. But more than anything, the cry of the Spirit this morning is that we get so sick of church the way it's been. And we get so sick of a form of the way that we think God is. And we stop singing about who he is and embrace who he is in our generation. He prayed. Leonard Ravenhill prayed. He said, oh God, make him a mighty man of God. Oh God, help him to touch the nations. Oh God, lift him up as a man of God. And he said he was just soaking that in. Oh, that prayer sounds good. But then Leonard Ravenhill prayed and he said, oh God, and wound him so deeply that he'll never be the same again. Hurt him so deep that he'll never be able to think again without doing what you tell him to do. Before ever God, almost always throughout the scripture and down through history, before God uses someone greatly, he wounds them very, very deeply. I want you to know Jacob had a limp in the socket of his hip. I want you to know that Samson had his hair chopped off and his eyes gouged out. Isaiah had burned lips. Every time God uses someone, he wounds them so deeply that they're never the same again. Here's my prayer this morning, that God will wound you so deeply this morning that you'll be ruined for anything else except what he has called you to do, that he'll touch you so deeply and you won't be able to get up and walk away from another event. I'm so sick and tired of events. I'm so sick and tired of just coming and not leaving the same, uh, different. God doesn't want you to come this weekend because I know Richard Crisco and his cry for this convention is that you don't just come this weekend and hear the things that are said or watch the human videos, but you walk away with a wound so deeply that you say, oh, for the rest of my life, that's what I'm going to give myself to. For the rest of my life, that's what I'm going to give myself to. 
Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I'm 37 years old today, and people ask me all the time, why do you preach to young people? Let me tell you why I preach to young people. Because I don't believe young people are dumb. Oh, that was your opportunity to really scream. People ask me all the time, why do you preach to young people? Let me tell you, the reason I preach to young people is because I don't think young people are dumb. I think young people are very, very smart. And I want you to know the reason that I preach to young people, adults, they kind of scare me a little bit sometimes because adults have to filter every decision they make through the way people are going to respond to them. Young people are not that way. You just tell a young person what to do and give them a cause worth dying for and they'll throw their life into it. You tell young people to make a hole in the wall and they're kind of like, okay, how big do you want the hole, <laughs> right? It's just, all right, here we go, I'll do it. Here's why I preach to young people. Mike Monica is sitting on the front row of this, this uh, auditorium today from Deland, Florida. Just a few weeks ago, I was in his city. You're going to hear about that church across America. I was in their city, and I went to a public school. I'll never speak a public high school assembly again the way I've always done it. Never again. I spoke in that high school for a voluntary assembly at Deland High School. 2,800 students in that school. We went there before, uh, ahead of time. We met with the principal, and we met with the leaders. And they said, you know what? What is your program like? And we told them it's a motivational program about telling students not to take drugs or not to drink or not to have sex until they get married, that they can be great in life. And he, but the principal told me, he said, but you're a preacher too, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, close that door behind you. We closed the door in his office. He said, listen, we've tried everything in the school. We've tried every National Education Association program. We've tried uh, uh, every uh, Goals 2000. He said, but we still got students that are drug addicts. We still got students that are prostitutes that are turning tricks during their lunch hour. They're dropping out so fast we can't keep them in the school. We can't build a daycare big enough to keep our students in this campus. He said, I don't, he said we've tried everything. He said, but I want to tell you something. He said, I've noticed something different about those young people in the church you're with. He said, I don't know what it is y'all are doing at that church. He said, but whatever it is, you can do it here. You can preach. You can pray. You can do anything you want to. Yes. And I got to tell you. That's throwing meat to a tiger. I stepped into a voluntary assembly that day, and I preached on the power of the cross of Jesus in front of that student body. And I want you to know 143 students with two coaches and their principal walked up on the platform and said, I want to serve Jesus. This is what I want to do with my life in a public school in Florida. In a public school. Let me tell you something. That's why I'm preaching this generation, because there's some young people in this room that are being wounded so deeply right now that you're going to be the John the Baptist and the Elijahs that are going to rise up in this generation and say, we're tired of the norm. We're tired of doing it the way it's always been. We're breaking out of the box, and we're going to do something for God that's never been done in our generation. We're not just asking for a revolution. We are becoming a revolution in our generation. Hallelujah. I believe God for that. Lift your hands to heaven with me right now. Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, for what you did through your servant, Michael Rowan, last night. We thank you, oh God, what you did through Brother Richard on Monday night. But, Father, we're asking for this morning for bread from heaven. Bread from heaven, oh God, for every youth leader, for every young person. That, Father, that you would wound us so deeply and that we would be the ones who would rise up in our generation now and stop talking about it and become the generation of doers now who will say we will speak the word of God in our generation generation. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. You hide me behind the cross now. Lift me above my abilities. Help me to preach this message today with passion. And, Father, may you touch us before we leave for lunch. And that, God, we will never, ever be able to walk out the same way again until you've done something so deeply and wounded us so deeply that we walk in the call of the Holy Ghost in our hour. We praise you, Lord, and we give you praise and glory for miracles and signs and wonders that will be released in this room right now. Lord, I pray for war angels and ministering spirits all around this convention center today, oh God. Hold the enemy back, and Lord, don't let us go on a mental vacation because we're tired, but let us be so focused this morning, like we're hungry and we've not eaten in days, and we'll receive the word gladly, and we praise you now, we receive it gladly now, in the name of Jesus, and everybody said out loud, amen. Come on, give the Lord one more shout before you're seated, as loud as you can. Come on, give him your best shout. Give him your best shout. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated in Jesus' name. Look at somebody next to you while you're seated and say, I lo 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 love you. Just tell them real quick, I love you, man. I'm glad you're here. Hallelujah. If you have your Bible, let's open them now to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 15. Mark chapter 16, 
beginning of verse 15. We'll look at God's word there together in just a moment. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. I want you to know that I'm so glad to be with you. Thank you, Brother Richard. I'll tell you what, these conferences are producing Holy Ghost terrorists that are going out to do something for the cause of Christ. And I say that because every, almost every one of us in this room have heard the things of God. We've heard the truth of God, but there's something different that happens at this conference every year that I hear across America that the things of God are being supernaturally poured out. Listen to me, the only difference between you and me this morning is perspective. I preach 50 weeks a year all across this country, and I can tell you that God has done something supernatural in your generation. The closest thing that I can associate what I see every week is the Azusa Street outpouring almost 95 years ago. At Azusa Street in a little bitty mission church in Los Angeles, California. How many of you know what I mean when I say Azusa Street? Wave at me if you would. Azusa Street was a little bitty mission church in Los Angeles, California when the fire of God fell in that little bitty mission. And God has a sense of humor. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. It was a white church that had a black pastor who only had one eye and his name was Willie Seymour. <laughs> that was his name. His name was William Seymour, and the fireman, there's a copy of this from the Los Angeles Times. The firemen went running one night. They saw leaping flames coming off of the building. They went running with buckets of water to put the fire out. When they got there, that black pastor with one eye met them at the door. He said, what are you doing here? He said, we've come to put the fire out. We saw the flames coming off of the building. He said, you're in the wrong place. There's no fire here. He said, sir, we saw the flames coming off of your building blocks away. We've come to put the fire out. He said, you're in the wrong place. There's no fire here. I'm sorry. He said, sir, we saw it with our own eyes, flames leaping off of the building. He said, I told you, you're in the wrong place. And then he said, really, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He said, oh, man. He said, you, he said, I want you to understand, the fire is not on the outside. The fire is on the inside. And the story goes that every one of those firemen walked inside that little mission church, got saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and most of them went into full-time ministry because the fire of God was burning so strong in the altars of that church. Can I tell you, it's happening again with youth groups all across America that are saying we're not worthy of anything else and we're not hungry for anything else except the fire of God. We're tired of mediocrity because mediocrity never impresses God. What moves the heart of God is a heart of excellence that says, God, with everything that I am, I know how to go to church, I know how to go through the motions, but Lord, I want to do something in my generation. See, the last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. Malachi chapter 5, verse 4, that says, he says, I'll, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, I'll send the pro spirit of, of Elijah, and he'll turn the heart of the fathers to their children, the heart of children to their fathers, or else I'll strike the land with a curse. Period. End of revelation. For 400 years, God did not speak to us for 400 years. And the last revelation we had from heaven was the word curse. God did not intend for his children to live under curses. Because 400 years later, in the book of Matthew, all of a sudden something began to change. And the first words we hear out of the book of Matthew are the words blessing. And God had to raise up somebody who could build a bridge from curses to blessings to reach from one generation to another. And he raised up a maniac named John the Baptist who was just different. He didn't march to the tune of religious organizations. He wasn't a part of an organization. He was a part of an organism. He was a part of something that was so alive that he was walking differently. And God raised him up to speak in his generation. The Holy Spirit spoke to me on New Year's Eve, just about 50 miles from here. In Mobile, Alabama, we had a, a conference that we did with Daryl Evans, who was leading in worship that night. 5,000 people gathered in a stadium, entering the new millennium. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Johnny, this is going to be a season in this year 2000 that I'm going to kiss the earth, and you're going to get caught in the smack. Everybody just, Mwah. everybody do that. Mwah. Just do that. Look at somebody next to you. Mwah. Just do that. It's going to be a season now that I'm going to kiss the earth and you're going to get caught in the smack. He said, Johnny, this is going to be a season. I'm going to clap my hands, and you're going to hear the thunder. I want you to know, right before God begins to move in an unprecedented way, he makes a lot of noise about it. God always makes a lot of noise. He's not doing something secret right now. He's making a lot of noise in our generation right now. There's a group of young people that are rising up who have had enough of status quo. They're trying to break out of the box. They're trying to roll back the stone. They're trying to pull the curtain back. They're trying to color outside the lines and say, God, we want to be a part of what you're doing right now. He's kissing the earth right now. He's clapping his hands, and we're, we're hearing the thunder right now. He doesn't want you to live under a curse today. He wants you to live under a blessing. But our nation's been under a curse. 
We can go back to 1962. From 1962 to 1964, before you were even born, there were events that took place in America that forever changed our country. I'm going to give them to you real quick. There was a Harvard University professor who studied and found that there were three things that changed America forever. He gave you three. I'm going to give you a fourth one this morning. He said there were three things in our generation that forever impacted America where we are right now from 1962 to 1964. The first was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. When an American president was killed, things went nuts in our country. How could an American president be killed? A door was open and the enemy began to walk in. The second event he listed from his Harvard studies was the arrival of the Beatles in America. That sounds kind of stupid at first, but I think he's right. That when the Beatles came to America, they brought an Eastern mysticism and a drug culture with them. That when John Lennon wrote the song, We All Live in a Yellow Submarine, he was hallucinating. And he made the statement in 1969 that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus Christ. He was assassinated in 1981 in New York. I wonder if in hell today he still believes he's more popular than Jesus. I doubt it very seriously. But a door was open. Elvis Presley, they called him Elvis the Pelvis, could only be shown on national television from the waist up. He was too rude, crude, and socially unacceptable. But a door was open when the Beatles came in that time frame, from 62 to 64. And a drug culture and a music style opened the door. Aristotle, the philosopher, said, as modes of music changes, society changes with it. Today, a generation later, MTV, VH1, and even country music television is showing us in America that it's no longer just from the waist up. It's full frontal nudity. A door was open in this country. And we have, not only do we have to listen to it now, we've got to watch it everywhere we go because of the advent of music videos. So it was the, the, the arrival of the assassination of an American president. It was a music culture that began to change. The third event was the Vietnam War. 58,168 men and women. We saw it on the video from the call a while ago. Bled and died for this country. It was the only war in American history we never really wanted to fight. And we sent people to their death for a war we never really believed in. The Harvard professor said those are the three events that forever impacted America for where we're living are today. Those are the three he listed. There's one he missed I'm going to give to you today. And it was the removal of prayer from the public schools in 1963 by the Supreme Court. When they made, listen to me. When they made that decision to remove prayer from the public schools, this simple prayer was offensive. God bless our parents, our teachers, our principals, and our country. When they pulled that out, you can look at everything in our society, from the school to the church to the family. Everything began to unravel, and things began to fall apart. But look at me today. How many of you believe with me that 35 years ago, when these things were happening, God knew what was happening? How many believe with me 35 years ago when these events took place that God had a plan? I'm going to tell you, I believe 35 years ago, God lit a fuse. Everybody do that with me. Do that with me. I believe 35 years ago, God lit a fuse and a time bomb has been burning in this generation all the way to the year 2000. And you know what? Something is happening in our generation that young people are saying, you know what? I'm going to throw off what the world is saying and I'm going to embrace the move of God. I'm not just going to sing Daryl's song anymore. Lord, I want to embrace the move of the Holy Spirit. See, I think I got a grip on this this morning. The worst thing that can happen to us for publicly standing up for God is they can beat us up. God can heal us. The absolute worst thing that can happen to us for standing for the things of God in our generation is they can kill us. We'll be with God. No more bills to pay. Yes. No more schools to attend. Yes. <laughs> no more curfews. Yes. No more politics. Yes. We know what politics means. Poly means many, ticks means bloodsuckers, right? No more of that, okay? All right. So the worst thing they can do is beat us up. God can heal us. The absolute worst thing they can do is kill us. We'll be with God. So I, I believe this is the cry of this generation. If they beat us up, God will heal us. If they kill us, we'll be with God. If they beat us up, God will heal us. If they kill us, we'll be with God. Come on, if they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with. If they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with. Now, how can Satan harm a generation who begins to live that way? 
How can Satan harm a generation that says every day when I get up, if it's my last day, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to do something for the kingdom of God. I'm going to break the curses off of my generation, and I'm going to be the John the Baptist in my day. I'm going to prepare the way of the Lord, and I'm going to build a bridge from a curse to a blessing in the things of God. Amen? Amen. Read this, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. The NIV says it this way. It's in red letters in my Bible. Jesus said it. He said unto them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Underline that right now with me if you would. Put a big circle around it and say this is for me. Under Verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Shout that with me. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Shout it loud. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Let me hear you loud. And these signs will accompany. I still can't hear you. Shout it loud. And these signs will accompany. Come on, one more time. Shout it loud. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Look at what it says next. It says, in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. When they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Shout it. And they will get well. Shout it. And they will get well. Read verse 19. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. And the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. I want you to understand that Jesus said, I've done everything I'm going to do now. Now I'm leaving it up to you, and I'm going to send a comforter. He's going to walk alongside of you. He's going to give you power. But I have done everything. Now it's in your hands. He left the disciples with a challenge and with a mandate. I've given you the power and the authority. Now you go and do what I'm about to challenge you with. And he said, go and preach this gospel. And in my name, you're going to cast out devils. In my name, you're going to speak in new tongues. In my name, you're going to pull deadly things and circum serpents off of people. And in my name, you're going to lay hands on sick people, and they're going to get well. In my name. Listen, he said, those who believe. Everybody shout, believe. Shout it, believe. believe. He says, those who believe he's, uh, will be saved. Those who don't will be condemned. That word believe means to accept as fact. To accept as as fact. He's saying in this generation, anybody who will accept this fact, what I have told them, and do what I'm calling them to do now. He said, these signs are going to follow them. We're not going to follow them. They're going to follow us. We're not going to be going looking for them. Let me tell you, if I see anything happening with the move of God in America right now, all across this country, is that we're moving from a time of just coming and soaking in the presence of the Lord, and now we're going out and mobilizing this generation right now to go and do what we were supposed to be doing all along. Everybody say, I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. Now look at me. We've been, we've, we, we're mobilizing this generation. I, I've done 82 Assembly of God district youth camps across America in the last nine years across this country. And, 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 and that's enough puberty for a lifetime. <laughs> we had a great time, man, in all of our youth camps. But you know what? The Holy Spirit arrested me just a few months ago. I was talking to Brother Richard about this. I'll never do youth camp the way I have before. The Lord told me, he said, Johnny, he said, you know what? Many times when we go to an event and we leave it, we don't know what happens after that. We come and we preach, but we don't know what happens. He said, I want you to get back in the local churches. And all summer long, this summer, the Lord just arrested me. I canceled all of my district camps, all of the event camps that I was going to be doing. And I've gone to local churches who have a passion to reach their city. And you know what we're doing? We're calling youth groups from all over the area to come in with us and to go out and cut grass for the elderly in that community and go out and paint houses for people that need a house painted and go out and door to door, house to house, mall to mall, running through areas telling people about Jesus. I was in Toronto just a few months ago, and we, uh, we were doing a youth convention. I said, you know what? Let's don't do just do a youth convention. Let's go do something. And we had 2,000 young people in that youth convention, and 600 of us met after the service, and we went to a mall in downtown Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And uh, we went in that mall. We called ahead of time. They gave us permission. We were running in there all around the food court area. And 600 plus of us got out in the parking lot and started doing the Jesus cheer. It was so loud they said they could hear us in the food court. So we started running, 633 of us just going, hey, 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 just running through the halls of that mall. People running out of the stores like, what in the world are they doing? So we ran in the food court area, circled the whole perimeter of that food court, Chick-fil-A, Burger King, Taco Bell's, McDonald's, Wendy's, and they were all in there, and we circled the whole area, about seven or 800 people in there eating, 
And we walked in there and we screamed out as loud as we could. Uh, I got up on the middle of a table right in the middle, just started pointing at everybody all the way around that area. And uh, the, everybody's looking around while they're eating. And the 600 people stood up and screamed, Jesus loves you, as loud as they possibly could. It was so loud they heard us out in the parking lot this time. People started running out of their stores. Listen, they gave us 15 minutes in that mall. The next 15 minutes, those maniac young people started going table by table and led 43 people to Jesus right there while they're eating their Taco Bells and their Chick-fil-A's and their Burger King. This is a generation that's looking for something to do. And we've been bringing young people together. And we've been going house to house, city to city, street to street, mall to mall across this country. I'll be in Oklahoma City in just a few days. We've got 500 young people meeting us for the express purpose of saying, you know what? I don't want to just come in here preaching. I want to go out and win somebody to Jesus. I want to go out and pray for somebody. I want to go out and do what God's calling me to do right now because I'm tired of just going through the motions. I want to do something for the kingdom. See, if they beat us up, God will heal us. If they kill us, we'll be with God. If they beat us up, God will heal. If they kill us, we'll be with God. If they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with God. That's the cry of this generation. He says this. He says this. He says, in my name, they're going to cast out devils. Now, people think going to church is boring. Going to church is not boring. It says we get to cast out devils. <laughs> that sounds pretty exciting to me. Listen, I was in, in LaGuardia Airport in New York City not long ago, and this little Buddhist man knelt down right next to me, pulled out his little mat, pulled out a little bitty fat wooden Buddha, and set up on a little chair right next to me, and started bowing down and worshiping this little Buddha right next to me. And I got to tell you, it made me mad. I got mad. I said, God, I can't believe the audacity of this guy bowing down and worshiping this false devil with hundreds of people going by. And the Holy Spirit said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, Lord, that, 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 that's not what I meant. What I meant was, God, I can't believe the audacity of this guy bowing down and worshiping this false devil with hundreds of people going by. And he said, but what are you going to do about it? So I realized what he was saying. So I reached over and I grabbed my Bible and I knelt down right next to him. <laughs> and he's bowing down his boot and he looks over at me and I lift my hands and I said, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. <laughs> and it was so funny, man. This guy's bound down at his Buddha, and he's looking at me, and it threw him all off of his rhythm. <laughs> he got all messed up, man. And you know what he did? He got his little Buddha, put it in his bag, rolled up his little mat, flipped me off, and walked away. And you know what I did? I just went, greater is he that is in me than the devils that are in that piece of wood that he's worshiping next to me. Hallelujah! Why? Because I says, I've given you all power and authority to cast out devils. Now look at me. We've got a Steven Spielberg mentality about what it means about demons. We think it's some Ghostbuster thing or it's some Steven Spielberg special effect that this green monster is going to come out looking at us and attack us. Listen, I'm going to tell you, we call it anger and depression. God calls it demons. We call it bad attitudes. God calls it demons. We call it alcoholism. God calls it demons. We call it pornography. God calls it demons. Let me tell you what. The Supreme Court can count out every law they want to. They can burn every church down. They can take every Bible. But they're gonna, not going to stop this generation from rising up in what God has for us. We're going to take authority over demons in this generation. Listen, you say, well, Johnny, that sounds real good. How can I do that? Let me tell you, if somebody starts telling a dirty joke next to you, lift your hands and watch the authority of God flow through you as you start talking about the things of Jesus. Every time I hear somebody tell a dirty joke or a curse, I just lift my hands and say, well, thank you, Jesus, for the power of God. You want to watch the demons run? Let me tell you what, they're afraid of you. Not because it's you, but it's because of who lives in you. Let me tell you what, we have minimized. We don't even understand how big he is inside of us. Listen, when we get so full of Jesus, the way we're trying to this weekend, coming here to get, get, just gather a glimpse of what it is he's trying to say to us. When we get so full of him, when the enemy comes against us, he doesn't think he's talking to you and me. He thinks he's talking to God. You have all power and authority over the enemy. You have, they can, let me tell you, you have all power. If they start telling it a dirty joke or telling some nasty words, lift your hands and start praising God right in the middle of them. I was flying back from Virginia Beach not long ago, and this man was on his way to Mardi Gras here in New Orleans. And how many of you know what Mardi Gras is? It is a heathen festival from hell. And this guy was drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning on this airplane, cursing everybody on the airplane. He was cursing the pilot. He was cursing the stewardess. He was cursing the carpet. He was cursing everything he could think of on this airplane. 
And I mean just curse, 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 curse. And about that time he started taking God's name in vain. Now that's my father he's talking about. All right, so here's my point. I made my mind up that day. If he's going to publicly damn the name of God, I'm going to publicly praise the name of God. I made my mind up. Let me tell you, the world's very loud about what they believe. If homosexuals and lesbians can march through Washington, D.C. shouting what they believe, I think it's high time for the church to stand up again and shout what we believe out loud, declaring what we understand as the truth of God. See, are you willing to give your life to something that's beyond just an event? Are you willing to go home and do something this time that's beyond just coming and hearing that I accept that challenge that I'm going to do it? Jesus said, I've given you the challenge now. I'm going away, but now it's up to you. Listen, this guy was cussing on that airplane, cussing everything, and we just started sparring on this airplane back and forth. And every time he'd curse, I'd just lift my hands and praise. So he'd curse. I lift my hands. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So he'd curse again. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I praise you, Jesus. So he'd curse again. Everybody do it with me. I lift my hands. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He'd curse again. Everybody do it. I lift my hands. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And listen, one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life, the airplane caught on fire. <laughs> One of the funniest things I've ever seen, smoke started coming up in the cabin, the luggage compartment caught on fire, and a little mask came out of the ceiling, and the, the captain came on and said, we don't know how bad this is, everybody put your mask on, prepare for a crash landing. And man, I'm going to tell you, people started freaking out on this airplane, they just started spazzing bad, and I just lifted my hands, I said, thank you Jesus that you supply every need, and you meet the need of my life right now. And that drunk guy punched me, and he said, hey man, pray for me too. <laughs> <laughs> now let me tell you something I looked at him I said I, listen you've been cursing God all morning die in your sins no I prayed for him alright and you know what man listen we made a perfect landing and the power of God came in that airplane and I talked to that guy about Jesus why because he says I'm going to give you power to cast out devils shout it cast out the devils we have the authority all authority and power say it all authority and power say it all authority and power he says wherever it manifests you take authority over it listen if they beat us up God will if they kill us we'll be with if they beat us up God will if they kill us we'll be with if they beat us up God will if they kill us we'll be with I was in New York City in David, David Wilkerson's church a couple of years ago we were ministering in the streets we had several hundred young people out there I was standing on a street corner, this big motorcycle guy on his Harley Davidson pulled up next to me. Typical Harley Davidson guy. Had his chopper, you know, with the handlebars way up here. <laughs> and had one of those wheels about 30 feet out in front of him. You know, had his motorcycle mama behind him. They had road dirt on their face from about three years ago. Had their beard growing down to his lap. Had on the little Harley Davidson black garb, the whole nine yards. And I'm standing there, and the Holy Spirit comes on me in the street corner in Manhattan. He's riding his bicycle through there. And the Holy Spirit says, tell that man I love him. And then God and I had an argument. I said, God, let me explain to you the reasons that's not going to happen. All right? All right. First of all, he's big, and I bruise easy. All right? All right? And secondly, God, I just don't know if I can do that. And about that time, the guy on the motorcycle turned and looked at me, and he said, what? <laughs> me? He said, what? What are you looking at? And I, and, and, I, and I got so nervous, I'm telling you, man. I got so fear, the spirit of fear tried to jump on me. And I looked at him and I said, I, 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 Jesus loves you, man. He said, what did you say? And I said, Jesus loves you, and, and I love you, and your mama loves you. And I, I, I was looking for everything I could dig out, man. I was petrified. And he said, he said what did you say? And, I said, Je and then the boldness of God came on me. I said, Jesus loves you, and your mama loves you, and I love you. And he stepped off his motorcycle, and he walked over there where I was. He said, have you been following me? I said, I said, no, man, I've been standing right here. He said, every time somebody tells, he said, my mama's been praying. He said, I know my mama's been praying. His mama was a Pentecostal preacher in Oklahoma. <laughs> and he said, every time somebody tells my mama loves me, he said, I know she's praying. And he fell down on his knees and began to weep right there because he knew he was backslidden and away from God. I want you to know that team and myself, we grabbed hands with him and his motorcycle mama and prayed with him. The power of God touched him on that sidewalk. He's a member of David Wilkerson's church in New York City today. He's serving God. He's faithful. Why? Because we have all power and authority over all the demons of the enemy. We have nothing to be afraid of. Let me tell you, this is a generation that lives by fear. It's a generation that is motivated by fear. We're fearful the way we dress. 
We're fearful. We, we, the way we dress, we, motive, we live by fear. The way we talk, we live by fear. And it's time for the church to rise up and say, fear's not going to dominate me anymore. I'm tired of living in fear. Listen, if they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with. Now listen, I've never been beat up for the cause of Christ. In our ministry in the last nine years, we've knocked on over uh, 600,000 doors across America. We've never been beat up. We've never been shot. We've never even had a dog bite us. <laughs> Worst thing that's ever happened, man, was we walked, this lady just planted some grass in her front yard in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we were in a hurry to get over to her house. And we, we started, well, come on. And we went over there and knocked on the door of her house, and she, we, we didn't know she had just put new grass in her yard. So, uh, man, we just uh, just walking right through it, and she came out and called me all kinds of names. <laughs> She cursed me like I ain't never been cursed. I mean, she, that woman could curse the paper off the wall. I'm telling you, she knew how to curse. Now, how many of you know if getting cursed for Jesus is the worst we ever endure, we've endured very little for the cause of Christ. And you know what, man? Everywhere we go, we have found out that the spirit of fear is dominating the church. It is time for young people to rise up and say, you know what? I'm not going to let fear dominate me anymore. Because you know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for you to set them free. They're sick of their drugs. They're sick of their alcohol. They're sick, man, of the pornography and the perversion. They're sick of the party life. They're looking for somebody that says, I have found the answer, and this is the way. Walk with me. We have all power and authority, all power and authority. And Jesus said, I've given, if in my name, if you accept as fact, say it, accept as fact, say it, accept as fact. If you accept as fact what I have called you to do, he says, these signs are going to follow you. In my name, you're going to cast out devils. I'm going to tell you what, that's an exciting life. It's not boring, it's exciting. That every day, listen, we don't get up in the morning saying, <laughs> Ah, things are so bad. Oh, Lord, help me. All right. Ah, oh, Lord, help me. That's not the way we get up every day. We get up for an opportunity to say, Father, as I go to the school today, I'm waiting for an opportunity to minister for you. I've just joined with another evangelist named Tom Sipling from Pennsylvania. We've just joined with him. And what we're doing is we're challenging students across America to join in what we're calling the 32nd kneel down. The 30-second kneel down that we're asking students. They so told us we can't pray in our public schools publicly. So what we're going to do is ask the students to go in. And if it's student-led and student-initiated, young people can do anything they want to on their campus. So we're challenging students to go to their locker well at the very first call of the bell in the morning. And as students are walking by, kneel down for 30 seconds in that locker well and lift their hands and cry out for the power of God to come in that school. Let me tell you, if, if, if Buddhists can do this and Hindus can do it, surely Christians can pray in their schools. We're asking them to kneel down and lift their hands for 30 seconds and pray for their principals, their teachers, and their friends and revival on that campus. Can you imagine what's going to happen? That no longer we're just standing at a flagpole. Now we're moving into the locker wells and our friends are walking by, seeing us on our knees, lifting our hands to heaven saying, what in the world are you doing? And we say, we're casting the devils out of this school. If they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with I'm going to tell you what, that really is how deep it really comes down to. It's no big deal for us if we know what God's called us to do. And you know what? I've never been beat up for the cause of Christ. Not yet. There's still an opportunity. It hadn't happened yet. I, I've, never been sh I've never been killed to this point. I have not died for the faith. So while I have an opportunity, I have a chance right now that I'm going to lift it up for Jesus. He says, I've given you the power and all power and authority to take authority over those strongholds that have been bondage. I'm sick and tired of seeing schools. And I walk in public schools all the time with our program. I'm sick and tired of seeing students bound up a little group of Christians and the, uh, and, and the drug addicts and the perverts being the ones on the campus dominating what happens there. Let me tell you, I don't care if they're the most popular, if they're the richest or the poorest on that campus. The only thing that separates them from God is an invitation. They need somebody who's bold enough to say, you know what? The power of God lives in me. How many believe he lives in you? Come on. How many believe the power of God lives in you? Then he says, I've given you the power. I'm giving you the authority now that you go out and you cast out devils. He said on and he said, in my name, they're going to speak in new tongues. How many of you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost? You're a tongue-talking, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled believer. Come on, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need God to so fill you this week that you walk out speaking a whole new language. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is a Pentecostal distinctive. And you know what makes us different is because we believe all the gospel. We believe that the speaking in tongues is for this generation. And let me tell you, we have backed way down from that doctrine. We've backed way away from the fact that we speak in tongues. I have a long time ago stopped feeling funny about speaking in tongues. I thank God that I speak in tongues. 
How many of you were raised in a Pentecostal church? Raise your hand real high. You were raised in a Pentecostal church. Ra raise your hand wave at me. All right. How many of you were not raised in a Pentecostal church? Raise your hand wave at me. Okay. About more of us have come into the Pentecostal church. Now, God plans it this way. I'm convinced God plans it this way. Very first time you go into a Pentecostal church, very first time, God plans it this way. You've never been in one before. Very first time you walk in, whoever you sit next to in that service, God's going to use them to speak in tongues and prophesy and scare the tar out of you. How many of you relate to what I just said? All right. First, I never forget first time I went to a Pentecostal church. My wife, the young lady that I was dating, uh, I'd asked, we went out on a blind date. Girl that I married now. Uh, she was definitely blind. And I, she said, I'll go out with you if you go to church with me. So I went to church with her the next day. Never been in a Pentecostal church before. I was raised Baptist. And I walked in there, and there was a woman about 130 years old sitting next to us. I mean, this woman was old as dirt. I'm telling you, man. And we were sitting in there, and all of a sudden, they started singing this song. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate all. That's exactly what the woman leading in worship sounded like. I'm telling you, man. I bought the tape. I've been practicing that for years. That's exactly what she sounded like. I'm telling you, man. It was a train wreck. And uh, they were singing that, and all of a sudden, it got quiet. And that woman, 130 years old, next to me, all of a sudden, she lifted her hands and she started going, she ta la la ta la ta la la ta la 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 ba Kind of something like that. I'm like, what is she doing? What, 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 what is she doing? What, 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 what is that? And my, my Karen said, Shh, I'll tell you later. She said, I said, I want to know right now or I'm leaving right now. So she took me to the Bible and said, well, this is what the Word of God says, that after the Holy Ghost comes on them, they begin to speak with other tongues. So I went to my Baptist pastor and I said, how come they pray in tongues and we're not? And here's what he said. Now, he's repented of this. And now he speaks in tongues, all right? But here's what he said, all right? He's, he, he said, listen, he said, Johnny, we don't believe in that. It went out with the apostles. It was only to start the church. It's not for today. Don't do it. It's of the devil. That's what a Baptist pastor told me, all right? So then I went back to the Pentecostal preacher. I said, how come y'all praying in tongues and we're not? Here's what he told me. He said, don't worry about speaking in tongues. He said, just come worship with us. What he was saying was you come hang around the pond long enough and you're going to fall in. And that's what happened, man. I got around. I saw some fire in a way that I'd never seen it before. And one night the pastor said, if you want to be, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues as the Spirit tells you, come down here and open your mouth and God will fill it. So I ran down there. I was 18 years old. I ran down there and I opened my mouth with passion. <laughs> and nothing happened. And then a little woman about 130 years old, she snuck up behind me and she said, hey, Johnny, you got to do more than just open your mouth. You got to speak. And she said, you know what? She said, she told me something. She said, you remember the faith that you used to get saved? And I said, yeah. She said, and I use the same faith to believe that God can fill you with the Holy Spirit. I said, that makes sense. She said, open your mouth and begin to speak. And at that moment of faith, God's going to fill you with his power. So my, my, I lifted my hands, I lift, opened my mouth, and I began to speak. And all of a sudden, an utterance came out that I didn't plan for. And, and, and the devil started screaming in my mind, you made that up. Who else did he tell that lie to? Come on. Who else? Come on, hold your hand up real high. All around the auditorium. Who else did the enemy tell that lie to? You made that up. Hold it. Hold your hand up real high so we can see it. Why would he tell all of us the same lie? You want to know why? Because he knows the power and the authority that's going to come with this gift. That after you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be witnesses of God, and you're going to go out casting out devils, and he doesn't want you doing that. And you know what? Then immediately the Spirit of God came back and said, no, you didn't make that up. And he said, that was me. And it started coming out a little bit more and a little bit more. And now I thank God that I can pray in tongues without ceasing. I can stir that up. Amen? He wants to lie to tell you that's not a real gift. It is a real gift. It is a power from heaven. The Bible says they were all gathered in the upper room. Everybody say upper room. Do this with me, upper room. Everybody say, when the wind fell on Pentecost, it filled the whole house. Everybody say whole house. Everybody do it. Upper room. Whole house. Upper room, whole house. Up, upper room, whole house. Upper room, whole house. Listen, when the wind of Pentecost began to blow, it didn't just fill the upper room, it filled the whole house. See, when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the way the Bible talks about it, it won't just fill your mouth, it'll fill your whole house. He wants to fill your whole house with the Holy Spirit. Listen, you can't get baptized in the Holy Spirit the way the Bible talks about it and keep it a secret very long. You can't keep it a secret very long. Either we are Spirit-filled or we're not. Let me tell you what. It says, after the Holy Ghost comes on you, you'll receive power to be my witnesses. It's not just so we can feel good when we're in church on Sunday. It's so that we can build up our most holy thing. How do big muscle-bound guys, guys kind of built like me, how do those big muscle-bound guys kind of, 
How do they become big muscle bound guys? It's, uh, they don't do it overnight. It's because they're lifting those weights over and over and over. You know what? You know how you build yourself up? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Stirring up your most holy. I know a, a, that pastor that I was telling you about, all right, he got in his bedroom not long ago and he started, he was watching T.D. Jakes on television, right? And that's dangerous to begin with. He's watching T.D. Jakes on television, and he gets his, in his bedroom. He says, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord. And all of a sudden, he said, man, in his bedroom, he said, all of a sudden, man, the power of God came on him. And he said, right there, Baptist preacher, and he's standing there, and he said, nobody grabbed my throat and said, glory, 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 glory. He said, nobody shook me until I fell. Nobody hit me, poured oil over me. He said, all of a sudden, man, the power of God just came over me. And he said, I began to speak, and all of a sudden, started just pouring out of me. And he was like, and he, after 30 minutes, he said, it just kept pouring out of him, poured out of him. And he said, all of a sudden, it dawned on him, I'm a Baptist preacher, praise God. <laughs> what am I going to do now? And it was on Saturday night when this happened. The next morning was Sunday morning. He was getting ready to go out and minister. And he said, every time he opened his mouth, that Holy Ghost language kept coming out of him. And he, uh, going to the First Baptist Church there in my city. And he goes in there, and he, he says, I was afraid to open my mouth. He said, I walked up, and one of the senior saints met me coming. And she said, well, Pastor, there's just a glow around you this morning. And he said, I was afraid to open my mouth. I didn't know what was coming out. He said, I just looked at her and went, mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And he said, I got into that morning. We were making announcements in the morning service. He said, I said, if you would, please open your bulletins. This week we're going to have. And he said, he looked up because <laughs> he realized what was happening. He said, everybody was looking at him like a, a cow looking at a new gate. Like, praise God. And the deacons got up and ran out in the hallway and had a little meeting. They came running back in and said, Pastor, we don't believe in this. You got to go. He said, I lifted my hands and he said, I'm free at last. I'm free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. He's pastoring, a <laughs> He's pastoring a charismatic church now over in Hurley, Mississippi, about an hour and a half from here. His church is exploding. Why? Because the Bible says after the Holy Ghost comes on you, you're going to have power to speak in tongues. Listen, you don't have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. It's just going to help you enjoy the journey here. You want power. How many of you want power when you leave this conference? You, you don't want to just come and plug into this. We could take two extension cords and plug one over on this side and one over on this side. Bring them to the middle and cut the ends off where it's just bare copper wire and touch them together. What's going to happen? And that's with 110 volts. Imagine what happens when the power of God begins to flow through us. He said, in my name, these signs are going to follow you. You're going to cast out devils. I'm going to ask you, man, are you giving God a chance? I am convinced that the only thing that God needs from us is an opportunity. If he didn't need us, we wouldn't be here. He works through people. He didn't die for horses, rocks, cows, dogs, and buildings. He died for people. And he wants to mobilize you right now. I am convinced that the only thing he needs is an opportunity. He just needs an opportunity to do a miracle. And if we'll just give him that chance, that God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep ministering until the miracle power of heaven flows. He said, in my name, you'll drink deadly poison. It'll not hurt you at all. You'll pick up snakes and they won't harm you at all. Now listen, he's not talking about figuratively here. We're not going to bring a snake box out here today and let a snake bite you and see who's spiritual enough and bold enough that if the snake bites you, you're all right. That's just dumb. That's not what he means. He's talking about in reference to the Great Commission again. He's talking about going out and preaching the gospel, mobilizing and going and doing what I've called you to do now. And he said, as you go and make disciples, as you go and preach the gospel, those who believe will be saved, those who don't will be condemned. And he's saying, you'll pick up snakes, but it won't hurt you. In other words, you'll touch deadly things in people's lives, and you'll pull it off of them, but it's not going to hurt you at all. You'll drink deadly poison. You'll be around those that have poison in their life, but it's not going to hurt you at all. It's not going to harm you at all because I have my power flowing through you. He's not talking about letting a snake bite us or going out and drinking a bottle of Drano. Right? He's talking about that no matter what the deadly things are in their life, I'm going to pull it off of them so that they can walk in the power and the authority of God. He says it's, it's not about the, the physical thing, it's about the spirit thing. See, we've got to get in a place. We've got to get in a place that I'm willing to walk into their life. I'm willing to walk into that school. Listen, I wish I could be in high school again. Dear God, I wish I could be in high school again. If I could be in high school again, I'd get the biggest, gaudiest Jesus t-shirt I could find. I mean, Jesus letters this big. <laughs> And I'd get that big 45-pound Bible my mom had on our coffee table when I was growing up. And I'd walk up and down the halls of that school singing, Yes, Jesus loves me. You're going to hell. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> 
If they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with. If they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with. If they beat us up, God will. If they kill us, we'll be with. That's the cry that God's asking you to answer this weekend. He's asking you to say, well, I put myself in a position that I'm going to move out with my youth pastor. I'm going to move out of my school. I'm going to move out of my church. And if nobody else has that fire, I've brought the fire. If nobody else brings it, God, I've got it. Because the worst thing they do is beat me up or kill me. So it's not a big deal. He said, in my name, you're going to cast out devils. You're going to speak in new tongues. You'll pull deadly things off of them, poisonous things off of them. And he said, you're going to lay hands on sick people, and they're going to get well. Listen, I was in Orlando, Florida just a few months ago. Johnny Wilson, Faith Assembly of God. We were there with 1,500 young people in a gymnasium. 1,500 young people were singing that song, I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. Just singing that song, dancing for the glory of God. And all of a sudden, we noticed in the back of the room there was a commotion in the back of the gymnasium. It was a girl who had spina bifida since she was born. She's never walked. Listen to me. Call Johnny Wilson, Faith Assembly of God. He'll tell you what I'm telling you. We walked into that room, and as we're worshiping, there was a commotion in the back. This girl was in a wheelchair, spina bifida, her body completely bent and wrinkled. It started, some of her friends grabbed her wheelchair and started running through the crowd all the way to the front of the room. Came up right to the front, to the altar area, just like down here. And Johnny Wilson was playing the piano. I was up here uh, leading. We were worshiping together. And all of a sudden, this girl starts pushing up out of her wheelchair. She's so desperate, she wants to get up with these other young people. She wants to dance with them. She wants to worship with them. 14 years old, never walked. Listen to me, I didn't lay hands on her. It wasn't one of the leaders, but two young people who were in that youth group reached over and grabbed her by the hands and helped her up. Listen, when they grabbed her by the hands, she stood up and her body straightened completely up. Spina bifida was healed instantly, instantly. It wasn't one of the preachers. It was two young people that reached over and grabbed her by the hands and she straightened her body up, her hands extended and she lifted her hands and began to scream and began to run back and forth in front of that auditorium. They all knew her and that place broke out for an hour and a half of just celebration as they saw the miracle flow in this girl's life. Many miracles happened as the presence of God moved through that room. The next day in her Christian school, and you know what most Christian schools are like? A lot of young people who are kind of indifferent, not really passionate for God because they hear it all the time. They hear the truth all the time and take it for granted. Instead of embracing the opportunity they have to be in a Christian environment, they make fun of it. Well, that school was the same way at Faith Assembly of God. We step in the next morning, and that young lady came in 10 minutes late on purpose, pushing her wheelchair down the middle aisle. They all knew her. She's been in that school her whole life. She's had to take the elevator up. They'd have to carry her upstairs. She's pushing it down the middle aisle, and everybody's freaking out. She comes up on the platform and begins to preach a message. And she said, last night, the power of God healed me. When two of my friends prayed for me, you better get right with God right now. And 73 students got up and came and gave their life to Jesus in a Christian school because they saw the miracle in that girl's life. Come on, somebody shout for that today. Hallelujah! I want to tell you this, I thank God for Benny Hinn, and I thank God for Oral and Richard Roberts, and I thank God for Catherine Kuhlman, but the greatest miracles that have ever been penned are yet to be performed by this generation that is sitting in this room right now. There's a day coming, listen to me, there's a day coming right now that there are going to be young men and women just like you, that when young people come in our youth groups and our churches and they have cancer, you're not going to back away, you're going to go lay hands on them, and the power of God is going to flow through you, and that cancer is going to get healed. They're going to come and give their life to Jesus because the miracle brought them to the kingdom. I've seen it happen. I was in Des Moines, Iowa just a few months ago, and there was a man who came in who was bound up by pornography and alcoholism. And during the worship service, he didn't wait till the end of the service. Hey, during the worship service, the glory of God fell. One of the young people walked over to him and discerned what was in his life and laid hands on him in the back of that room, cast the devil of pornography and perversion off of him. He fell out in the power of God right there in that, that, the back of that room. They picked him up a few minutes later, brought him to the front. He got radically saved and has become one of the leaders in the master commission of that church saying, God, I'm going to do something for the kingdom of God. Why? Because these signs will follow those who believe. Say it. These signs will follow those who believe. Shout it loud. These signs will follow those who believe. Shout it. These signs will follow those who believe. Those who accept as fact. I'm asking you today, do you accept it as fact? Do you accept this fact? I'm asking you with Richard Crisco today that we're not just interested in what you do here. We're asking that when you go home, are you going to say, God, the power of God lives inside of me and there's no devil that I don't have authority over? So, thank you. That was three of us. That God, the power of God lives in me and there's no devil that I don't have authority over. 
See, you know what? We just aren't convinced that we really believe that. Sounds real good. It's a Christian sound bite. But I want you to know my heart and my passion for you right now is that you don't just come this morning and hear the challenge, but you say, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. This is my day, and I'm accepting the call. I'm not just going to go to Washington, D.C. to the call, although I'm going to be there as a part of that. But I'm going to, on a daily basis, begin to operate in the authority of heaven that flows in my life. We have all power. Listen, that same group of young people in Toronto that we carried into that mall and sang in the food court. Let me tell you about one 13-year-old girl. I'll never forget her as long as I live. 13 years old. We went to Wendy's to get something to eat. You, you can tell I like to eat. Praise God. I'm growing in the ministry. <laughs> I'm expanding from a temple to a cathedral. All right. All right. I'm growing in the things of God. I mean, you think I'm big now, man. I used to be so big, I wore guest jeans and the answers popped out. <laughs> I mean, I used to be so big, man. Uh, I wore a VCR for a pager. All right. You think I'm big now, man. I used to jump in the air and get stuck. All right. Anyway, that's enough. And... We went over to Wendy's to get something to eat. The mall personnel came out and they said, you got to get out of here. It was way too loud in that mall. And that one 13-year-old girl stood back with us. She stood back and it was one 18-year-old guy walked up to us. He knew her. He knew the church she was from. He looked at her and he said, shut up. He said, for the last 15 minutes I've been trying to eat my hamburger. You guys have been screaming all this Jesus stuff. Shut up. And I'm going to tell you, man, it really took me and the youth director by surprise. We weren't really prepared for that. And the Holy Ghost rose up in her and she looked at him and she said, no we don't have to shut up and you know what she's right we've been quiet way too long we've been quiet way too long she said we don't have to shut up listen I'm gonna tell you this you know what she did he, he said listen I've been to your churches there's nothing to this Jesus thing you're talking about he said when you leave you're just like me and she said no man she said I'm not like you she said Jesus has changed my life she said as a matter of fact she said if I pray for you right here in this Wendy's, will you believe God's real? He said, you can pray for me, but nothing's going to happen. Listen to me. Call Mark Griffin in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. 905-637-5566. We saw it with our eyeballs. The spirit of Elijah came on this girl to break a curse and move a boy into a blessing. 13 years old, she lifted her hands and she said, Father, she said, in the name of Jesus, touch him right here. She reached over and laid her hands on him, and as soon as she touched him, he fell out in the Holy Ghost right there in a Wendy's restaurant and began to tremble under the power of God. Shaken in the power of the Lord. The manager came running out and said, y'all are ruining my business. They said, get this guy out of here. They carried him out in the parking lot led him to Jesus. That night, that girl stood in a youth convention with 2,000 young people, and that young man came with her. He said, I've been drunk, I've been high, I've had sex, I've had a lot of experiences in my life, but I have never felt anything like what happened to me when that 13-year-old girl prayed for me at Wendy's this afternoon. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for somebody to set them free. The power of God lives inside of you to set them free. The question is, what are we doing with it? Are we mobilizing? Are we mobilizing? Are we mobilizing? Or are we just sitting in a building and screaming the same old songs? Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. David Wilkerson, understand, is saying it's a day that we've got to move out and mobilize this army. David Ravenhill, who is the son of his great father, has said if revival has impacted America, then why do we still have crime rates that are out of the sky limit? Why do we have students killing themselves so fast in this country? Why do we still have people who are not bowing their knee to Christ in this nation? If revival really has come to our nation, then where is the impact? Where is the impact? What are we really doing? You know, everybody focuses on Cassie Bernal, and I thank God for the story of Cassie Bernal. But I'm going to tell you what. My heart breaks today for Eric Klebold and Dylan Harris. Where was the church when the demons had those boys so messed up that they were sitting in their closets making bombs and looking for somebody to love them? Where was the church when Adolf Hitler was a little boy and he began to dream a dream about a perfect race? Where was the church to cast the devil off of him? Where were we? Where were we when Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris walked into that school with their shotguns and began? Where was the church? God is calling us today and saying, where is the church for the alcoholics and those that are so beaten and bruised and the pedophiles and those that are abused in their families that somebody desperately, would you please come and set me free? Would you please come and set me free? Would you please come and set me free? 
That's what they're crying out for you when you get back to your city. They're crying out, where, where was the church? I had a young man in my youth group years ago in Mobile, Alabama. His name was Byron Kinsey. And I loved him with all of my life. And Byron Kinsey, when he was in the eighth grade, he was not a great student. He was make, failing out, as a matter of fact. He started hanging with the wrong group. One day, his friends went out drinking and driving, and he was underage, and he was with them. They got caught, and they had to go to jail. His parents had just gotten saved, but they didn't know what to do with their eighth-grade son. They called me. They said, he's in jail. Would you go get him? And I went down to the judge, and I said, Judge, would you please let me be his probation officer? And I want you to make him come to church. I said, give him a choice. Either go to jail or come to church for the next three months, every service, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every day, he's got to come. So he had a choice. He could either go to jail or he could come to our church services. He came, and the judge let me be his probation officer. Byron Kinsey hated my guts, man, the first Wednesday that he came. He hated everything about me. He didn't want to be there. But he came the next Wednesday night, and he got saved. He came the next Wednesday night and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He never left our youth meeting again. He became my number one helper. There was nothing I couldn't ask Byron to do. He had a passion for God, but at the same time, he was a genius and didn't know it. He never made a B in the, eighth, uh, in the ninth grade. He never made a B in the 10th, the 11th, or the 12th. He graduated the salutatorian of Mary Montgomery High School in Mobile, Alabama. And he went on, man, his, his desire was to be a medical missionary. But more than that, he loved God, just wanted a passion to serve the Lord. Byron had his senior portraits taken, and he came in and laid them on his mom's table and said, Mom, I'm looking forward to going to college. But more than that, Mom, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. She didn't think a lot about it that night. Next night he came in about midnight from a date. A young lady planned to marry. He said, Mom, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to college. But more than that, Mom, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. She thought it was strange that he said the same thing two nights in a row. That night at 2.38 in the morning, something happened in Byron's life that he wasn't prepared for, his parents weren't prepared for, and I wasn't prepared for. He was my number one helper. And that night at 2.38 in the morning, Byron's heart exploded and he choked to death in his own blood in 20 seconds. He had a rare heart disease that nobody knew that he had. The bone in his chest cavity were too large and his arms were too long for the structure of his frame. And for 18 years, it was rubbing a hole on the side of his heart. That night at 2.38 in the morning, the heart that rubbed that hole all the way through and it exploded. He choked to death in his own blood. Byron went to be with Jesus in 20 seconds. And I knew him. I knew him intimately. And I began to cry out, Lord, why? Why? And at his funeral, I stood up with all of those of the young people. 1,100 students came to his funeral from that school because they all loved him. He was, they called him the preacher boy on his campus. They all loved Byron. When he came to that funeral that day, we preached on Byron's life. And Byron had a rare heart disease that nobody knew that he had. He didn't know that he had it. The doctors didn't know he had it. His parents didn't know he had it. But God knew. And you know what the problem is in the church today? we got a heart disease that we don't know that we have. And that is that we think that going to church is enough. We think that going to an event is enough. We think that shouting the shout is enough. But you know what the cry of the Spirit is right now? The cry of the Spirit right now is that you say, God, I want to get beyond just going to the building. And I want to go to the place that Luke chapter 14, chapter 16, verse 15 becomes alive. Mark 16, 15 comes alive in my life. That in, my, in his name, that I'm going to go and cast out devils. That in his name, I'm going to speak in new tongues. In his name, I'm going to pull the poisonous things off of him. In his name, I'm going to stand up and once and for, my, for all in my life, I'm going to find something that's worth dying for. And I'm going to be the one that there's not going to be another Eric Claybold. There's not going to be a Dylan Harris. There's not going to be another one who's going to come up. I'm going to be the one. And before they ever get so bound up by the demons, before they ever get so bound up by the drugs and the alcohol, I'm going to be the one God that's going to go lay hands on them and break that thing off of them and set them free. I'll be the one in my generation that will go and save them and pull them out of that thing that they're in. Lift your hands to heaven with me, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you today. Where is the church? Where is the church when the Supreme Court, when the Supreme Court can begin to make its decisions the way they're making? Where is the church when we can allow a partial birth abortion ban to be given by the Supreme Court? Where is the church when they say that we can't pray at football games anymore? Where is the church when they say we can't walk that way? 
I'm going to ask you to just lift your hands to heaven and say, Holy Spirit today, Holy Spirit today, let me answer that call. Let me answer that call today that I'm not just going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to become it. I'm not just going to think about it anymore. I'm going to become it. Where's the church? I want you to ask yourself right now, where is the church in my city? Are we setting the captives free? Are we just singing our same old songs in our buildings that we've been singing forever? Where is the impact of revival? Are we really seeing it happen? Are we mobilizing this generation to move in that way? Come on, lift your hands and say, God, let me feel the weight of a lost generation today. Come on, lift your hands and say, Father, help me to feel the weight. Listen to the cries of a lost generation right now. They're screaming for you to hear them. They're screaming for somebody to come and set me free. You have the power. You have the authority. They're screaming for somebody to come and set me free. Where was the church? For? Where was the church in Littleton, Colorado? Where was the church in Germany? Where was the church for a Jeffrey Dahmer who mutilated women? Where was the church when those who walked in their darkness and their bondage? Where was the church when they were in their sin and their degradation? Where was the church when they were bound by their addictions? Come on, lift your hands and say, Lord, help me to answer that call today. Help me to be the one, Lord, today. Come Holy Spirit in this room right now. Come Holy Spirit in this room right now. Come Holy Spirit. Michael Rowan last night asked you, who's worthy to carry the torch? I want to pick up where he left off tonight and ask you, Who's going to be the one that's going to cast the devils off of them? They're bound by strongholds. They're bound by addictions. It's got to move beyond talking about it. It's a call that while you're in Pensacola this week, that you leave a deposit. That every when you go to Whataburger or you go to McDonald's, that if somebody's full of the devil, you cast it out of them right there at McDonald's. That you lift up the cause of Christ and you lift up the standard. Are we willing to die for something? This is a generation that our government says it's not willing to die for anything. But I believe that there are young people in this room that the Holy Spirit says, I want to use you to be the one who will go pull that off of them. That they don't become the murderers anymore. They don't become the alcoholics anymore. They don't become the addicts anymore. They don't become the perverts anymore. But you pull it off of them from the top of this room to the floor, from side to side to front to back. The thousands of young people in this room. There was only 120 in the upper room. The Bible says that they turned the world upside down. There's thousands of us in this room that if we really mean what we're here at this convention for, it says we're branded by the fire. Are we going to be so touched so deeply that just like Jacob having a limp in a socket of his hip, that God, I'm never the same again. I'm ruined for the world. But I've got to manifest what you told me to do. And I'm not going to just sit in the church anymore and rot. I'm going to go and do it, Lord. I'm going to go and do it. There's a big cost involved in this. If you come and you raise your hand and you step forward for what I'm about to ask you, if you do it because you think the person around you wants you to, you're doing it for the wrong reason. If you're doing it because Richard Crisco or I or a pastor wants you to do this, you're doing it for the wrong reason. But if you're sitting here today and saying, Holy Spirit, I feel that fire burning in my heart that there are people in my city that are bound by devils. And if I don't set them free, God, who's going to do it? There are people in my city that have poison and they have snakes around them. If I don't pull it off of them, God, who's going to do it? There are people in my city who are sickness, God. They have cancer, and they have, they're, they're bulimic, and they're anorexic, and they're depressed. And if I don't set them free, God, who's going to do it? This is the cry of the Spirit for your heart right now. The cry of the Spirit for you. I want you to look at me right now before we pray. When I was 18 years old, I had the job of my home church at the Baptist church that I told you about of locking and unlocking the church every Sunday was a big responsibility for an 18 year old. It was my job to lock the doors of that building. I had to turn the lights on, turn them off. I was the leader of our youth ministry uh, and I really had a passion for God, but I wanted to know what God's will was for my life. God, do you want me in the ministry? I began to believe he was calling me. And I stepped out and I went to the, the pastor that night after Sunday night and I said, pastor, would you mind if I come back to the church and I just unlock the door and come in and just seek God. I want to seek God all night long. He said, I'll be fine. Just turn the lights off when you leave. I'll never forget that night walking into that room. I got my boom box and I got my Bible and I walked into the platform and I sat down. Opened my Bible and I turned on some radical Holy Ghost maniac Christian music. It was Sandy Patty. 
was all we had then. And I turned on the music and I opened my Bible and I fell hard asleep. At three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I felt like such a failure. The devil was screaming at me. You tried to seek God. You tried to make a difference for the kingdom. But look at you, you can't even stay awake to seek his face. What do you think you're gonna do? What will you ever become? And I believed those lies. And I believed I was a failure. And I walked out of that sanctuary that night feeling useless. I got a degree in electrical engineering. I graduated and hated it. God began to call me again. And he said, son, do you remember the night that you laid on that platform for three hours and you sought me and you fell asleep and you felt like a failure? And I said, yes, Lord, I remember. He said, Johnny, it wasn't a failure to me. He said, it was precious to me that for three hours you laid on that platform and I held you and it was so precious to me that you wanted to seek my face. He said, Johnny, you didn't know it that night. He said, but it was that night that I called you to the ministry. And he said, Johnny, because you said, I want to do something. I touched you that night and said, I'll use you. There are some of you in this room that feel like such a failure. You love God with all of your heart, but the enemy so lied to you and said, I know what my failures are, man. I know my mistakes, but the enemy is a liar. And he says that those failures will stop you from ever doing anything from God. He cannot tell you the truth. And I'm asking you today to press past your failures that every time you get up and walk toward God, the enemy knocks you back down and says, don't do it. You can't do it. There are many hundreds of you, maybe even thousands of you in this room that that failure has locked you down from being the one that would cast the devils out. That failure has locked you down from being the one who would heal them. That failure has locked you down from being the one that would open your mouth and proclaim the good news. I'm asking you today to press past that failure. I move beyond my failure to where I am today and I have the privilege of standing here. Come on, lift your hands to heaven and say, God, help me to move past my failure now. I want to move. If you're in this room and the enemy's been lying to you and failure has held you locked down, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. You say, Johnny, every time I try to stand up, failure tries to lock me down. And you come on, lift your hands and cry out and say, God, I'm tired of feeling like a failure. I'm tired of feeling like a failure. I'm tired of feeling like a failure. There are thousands standing in this room right now. Break that demon lie right now. Come on, take authority over that lie. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. Come on, cry out to the Lord with me and say right now, God, I hear your cry. I hear your cry that they're out there and they're bound by addictions. They're bound by strongholds. And God said, if I don't go get them, they'll become the murderers in my generation. God, they'll become the addicts. They'll become the pedophiles. I've got to go and get them. Listen, you're not a failure. Press past your failure right now. Cry out for it right now. Cry out for the Lord right now and say, God, once and for all, I want to bury that failure behind me and say that failure is not going to lock me down anymore. Come on, come on, make your way to the altar and say, God, right now, come on, if you're in this room and you say, I'm tired of feeling like a failure, I'm tired of feeling like a failure, start stepping this way right now. Throw that devil off of you. It's a demon spirit that we're going to break off of you right now. We're going to break the spirit of fear off of you right now. We're going to take all authority over the enemy over you right now. And the Lord's calling you now to be the one who will rise up. Come on, lay those failures down. Lay those failures down right now. Every failure. Come on as close as you can. If you have to stop in the aisles, just stop in the aisles. Kneel down and say, God, today I'm burying this failure. I'm getting out of that demon stronghold once and for all. I'm getting, come on right now. They're coming out by the thousands. Come on, believe right now. Believe right now. Bury that failure. Come on right now. Every bit of it. Tell the devil right now, that lie won't work on me anymore, devil. I'm burying my failures. I'm burying all of my mistakes. I'm burying every time that I got up and fell down. Come on right now, his cry is in this room. Give it to the Lord right now. You picked up the torch last night. You picked up the torch last night. Now bury your failures and break that demon stronghold off of you today. And say, Lord, I'm going to go out and do it now. I'm going to cast the devils out of my generation. I'm going to heal the sick in my generation. If they beat me up, you're going to heal me, God. If they kill me, I'm going to be with you. But I know this is your cry. Oh, there's a place within my heart. The Lord to cry is for only Where is the church? Where is the church? Where is the church? See the bride united. Let the children come. Let 
Now come on, cry out for it right now. Bury those failures. Bury those failures. Bury those failures. Make me more like you. Come on, groan in the spirit for it right now and say, Lord, it's my time, it's my generation. Where is the church in my generation? Where is the church in my generation? Those of you in the back that couldn't make it to the front, just cry out to the Lord. Those in the aisles, cry out to the Lord and say, God, I'm giving you all of my failures. Those of you in your seat, stretch your hands toward them and pray right now that they're going to get off of this floor different. They're going to get off of this floor different. They're going to get off of this floor different. They're going to get off this floor different. Set us free, Lord. Set us free, Lord. It's happening in this generation. It could happen for you that you leave this room today and you walk out casting out devils. You walk out healing the sick. I'm asking you to embrace the call. Embrace the call of the Lord right now. Cry out. Cry out. Cry out for his healing. Cry out for his mercy. Cry out for his anointing. It's for you right now. Don't stop. Don't stop. Cry out for it right now. That little voice that tells you that you're spending up time is not the voice of the Lord. It's the voice of the enemy. Try and once again to silence your voice. Lift your voice and say, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm not going to let my failure stop me anymore. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm not going to let my failure stop me anymore. Come on, declare it out loud. Let them send a message to hell today. Send a message to hell today. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I hear the call of the Lord. I will not be afraid anymore. I hear the call of the Lord. My failures won't stop me anymore. I see it now. I see it now. I see it now. I'm overcoming that heart disease. I'm overcoming the past. I'm overcoming my failures. Where is the church? Where is the church? Where is the church? Where is the church? Where is the church to stop the next murderer? Where is the church to stop the next drug addict? Where is the church to stop the next child abuser? Where is the church to stop the next alcoholic? Where is the church? Where is the power? Reach up and grab it today. Reach up and grab it today. Cry out for it from your seats. Cry out for it from the floor. Take authority over the spirit of fear, Lord. Come on, lift your voice and say, I'm not going to be afraid. You spirit of fear, leave me. Leave me. Leave me. I will not be afraid. Father, may the blood of Jesus so surround us now that fear is broken off of us. Fear is broken off of us. Fear is broken off of us. Come on, those of you in your seats, don't just sit and watch. Everybody in this room, reach up and embrace faith in God today. Faith in God today. That when you go back to your city, this time, it's not just going to be hearing about it. You're going to go and cast the devils out. You're going to lay hands on them until they get healed. You're going to prophesy to the mountain until it moves. You're going to speak the word of God to those around you. Where is the church? Where is the church to stop the next murderer? Where is the church to stop the next alcoholic and drug addict? Where is the church to stop the next bulimic or anorexic? Where is the church to stop that one that is so suicidal they want to blow their brains out? Where is the church to cast the devils off of them that they can live in power and authority? Come on, throw your failures down. Throw your failures down and say, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. My life is not behind me. It is in front of me. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, today. Father, come to this conference right now and pull failures off of us.
us. Pull the chains of yesterday's failures off of us. And today let us rise up in the anointing of God to walk out in a bold declaration that I will be his hands, I will be his feet, I will be his voice, and I'll give him a chance to do a miracle. God, I'll do, come on into your hands and say, God, I'll give you a chance. I'll give you a chance. You can cast the devil out through my hands. You can speak through my voice. You can look through my eyes. I won't let yesterday stop me anymore. I'm rising up. Come on, cry out for it right now. Lift your voice and say, I know it's my time. Oh, God, raise up the John the Baptist in this room. Raise up the John the Baptist. Let that anointing of, that, of John the Baptist come in this room today, God, that we will prepare the way of the Lord. We will prepare the way of the Lord. We will prepare the way of the Lord. Let him wound you deeply. 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 Come today, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fire. They're waiting for us in our schools. They're waiting for us in our church youth groups. They're bound in our youth ministries. They're bound by their addictions. They're bound by their sin. They're waiting for us to set them free. They're waiting for us to set them free. And they said, in my name, in my name, you'll drive out the demons. In my name, you'll heal the sick. In my name, You'll pull the deadly things off of them. In my name, come on, accept the call of the Lord today. Accept the call of the Lord today. If they beat us up, Lord, you'll heal us. If they kill us, Lord, we're going to be with you. You foul devil of fear. We curse you in the name of Jesus. We curse you. I want you to curse the spirit of fear with me right now. Curse the spirit of fear right now. Curse the spirit of fear. You foul devil of fear. You've had us bound up, bound up long enough. You've had us manipulated. You've had us shut down long enough. But when we get home, our church is going to see something different. We're going to pick up that torch. We're going to take that torch and we're going to sit in that chair. We're going to rise up now. And we're not going to be afraid anymore. We're not going to be afraid of those in our schools. We're not going to be afraid of those in our city. Every devil must bow to the name of Jesus. Every knee must bow to the name of Jesus. Father, do it through this generation, just like you did on the day of Pentecost. Let the 120 turn the world upside down. Do it in this room today, oh God, that we leave this conference to go and do, to go and do, to go and do it now, God. I speak to the spirit of fear and we take authority over that right now by the blood of Jesus. If you've wanted to stand up for God, but you've been afraid, lift your hands right now and say, I'm tired of being afraid. I'm throwing that thing off of me right now. I'm tired of being afraid. Lift your voice and shout to the Lord and say, I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of being afraid. Oh Lord, we're tired of being afraid, God. We're tired of being afraid. We're tired of being afraid. We're tired of being motivated by fear by the way we dress and the way we talk, by the way we live, God. We want the bold anointing of the Holy Ghost to come on us today. Throw it off today. Throw it off today. Throw it off today. Lift your hands to heaven all across this room and say, I'm tired of being afraid. Come on. Come on, once and for all. This, this will just be another service. Or once and for all right now, we're going to embrace. Hey, Lord, we embrace your move. We embrace your move. Hey, Lord, we embrace your love. Go 
Come on, pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, stir it up within you and lift your hands and say, I'm tired of being afraid. The drug addicts are waiting for you to go home and set them free. The alcoholics are waiting for you to go home and set them free. The suicidal tendencies are waiting for you to go home and break them. The depressions, the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the idolatry, the pornography, they're waiting for us. Come on, lift your hands. If you say, Johnny, I accept that call today, that this time I'm going home, and I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to go to them, and I'm going to break that thing off of them without fear, without fear. Come on, lift your voice and say, today I accept that call, that I'm going to go home today, and I'm not going to be afraid, but I'm going to let the Holy Spirit begin to flow through me the way the Word of God says it can, that in His name, these things are going to happen through me. I'm going to cast out devils. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to pull the things off of them. Come on, cry out for it. It's called the Shabbat praise. Lift your voice and shout for it right now. The Bible says the walls come down when they shout. Cry for it. It's my day. Thank you, Johnny, for coming and, and speaking the word of the Lord to us this morning, for challenging us. And thank you for more than that. Thank you for living the life for us and showing us the way. Father, raise up more, Lord, in this room. Lord, who will be much more than just talk. But Lord, I pray that there'll be, a, there'll be, be a, a remnant in this place that will begin to live it out, face their fears, and overcome, for we always triumph for you, Lord. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.